Let's see. To start off, we're going to be doing this reading slightly different. We've been up against a handful of sections in the past that have pushed us into, we will say, multi-week readings, to put it generously. This is one of those sections. It is one of those things that is cursed to be both long and deeply interesting throughout. So because of that, we are going to be taking our time to do analysis on this section. We're going to be going through it as we do. And we are not going to be doing a review until we wrap up all of the sections. So that means today, Monday, we are going to be doing a reading. It means tomorrow we're going to be doing a reading. And then next Monday, we're probably going to be finishing the section off. So the, this is going to be a fairly consistent thing. So maybe uh, as we get our way through the rest of this. But for now, um, uh, any major announcements, anything going on? Uh, I know you, you just mentioned we're getting uh, Ginsburg is finally going to be reading uh, the text that I submitted to the literature reading group this Saturday, Jack. That is correct. Uh, Kadish by Ginsburg pulled through by just a vote today, but that will be um, that will be discussed on Saturday at noon PDT with the literature group. Uh, likewise, I'll mention that the Simonden group will be meeting the following day on Sunday at 11 a.m. PDT, and I believe they are still reading technical objects. And I know we have a ton of other readings going. Please uh, jump up into the uh, rolling calendar section, and you can see everything that's going on. It's uh, it's extraordinary uh, how many readings we're now a part of or connected to. Kind of overwhelming and pretty awesome. But this reading that all of you are here for is anti-Oedipus. So I'm going to go ahead and kick it off. And uh, I did some, uh, I read I read half of the section uh, last night in prep, and I'm going to have so many questions, but I love how it starts. So we'll, we'll go ahead and just dive in. The schizoanalytic argument is simple. Desire is a machine, a synthesis of machi machines, a machinic arrangement, desiring machines. The order of desire is the order of production. All production is at once desiring production and social production. We therefore reproach psychoanalysis for having stifled this order of production, for having shunted it into representation. Far from showing the boldness of psychoanalysis, this idea of unconscious representation marks from the outset its bankruptcy or its abnegation, an unconscious that no longer produces but is content to believe. The unconscious believes in Oedipus. It believes in castration, in the law. It is doubtless true that the psychoanalyst would be the first to say that, everything considered, belief is not an act of the unconscious. It is always the pre-conscious that believes. Shouldn't it even be said that it is the psychoanalyst who believes? The psychoanalyst in each of us. Would belief then be an effect on the conscious material that the unconscious representation exerts from a distance? But inversely, who or what reduced the unconscious to the state of representation, if not first of all a system of beliefs put in the place of productions? In reality, social production becomes alienated in allegedly autonomous beliefs at the same time that desiring production becomes enticed into allegedly unconscious representations. And as we have seen, it is the same agency, the family, that performs this double operation, distorting and disfiguring social desiring production, leading it into an impasse. Uh, Let's dive in. I'll make a few bold statements, and then anyone can uh, come in. Uh, it's a it's a great way to start this section because it essentially is a very very basic overview of I think the last few sections that have been leading up to this overall discussion. Uh, I was I was as I was editing uh, section four point two and the review uh, last night, which by the way are live now. One of the things I really loved is uh, as we talked about. The way that uh, when we talk about molar versus molecular, their big thing here is that while we have these two sort of, uh, we'll say, orders of magnitude, the reality is they aren't necessarily separated, that the machines of the very tiny uh, ultimately feed into and are part of the machines that make the larger. And they, I think, say that very, very clearly here. Uh, all production is at once desiring, desiring production and social production. Uh, the idea of the small machines make the larger. It's a great little sentiment I wanted to make sure I brought back up. Any other comments before we move on? Because it is a fairly straightforward paragraph. 
I want to say I like this um, this reminder that once again we're dealing with uh, the unconscious through an ontology of production or machinic uh, being, right? And um, in contrast, right, they're laying out how that differs as the method of schizoanalysis from the uh, the method of psychoanalysis, which is going to deal with belief and is going to deal with how that belief sort of coordinates within the framework of um, that more psychoanalytic uh, representation, particularly the familial here. All right, next paragraph. Thus the leak link between representation belief and the family is not accidental. It is the essence of representation to be a familial representation. But production is not thereby suppressed. It continues to rumble, to throb beneath the representative agency that suffocates it, and that in return can make resonant to the breaking point. Thus, in order to keep an effective grip on the zones of production, the representation must inflate itself with all the power of myth and tragedy. It must give a mythic and tragic presentation of the family and a familial presentation of myth and tragedy. Yet aren't myth and tragedy too productions, forms of production? Certainly not. They are production only when brought into connection with real social production, real desiring production. Otherwise, they are ideological forms, which have taken the place of the units of production. Who believes in all this? Oedipus, castration, etc.? The Greeks? Then the Greeks did not produce in the same way they believed? The Hellenists? Do the Hellenists believe that the Greeks produced according to their beliefs? This is true, at least, of the 19th century Hellenists, about whom Ingalls said, you'd think they really believed in all that, in myth and tragedy. Is it the unconscious that represents itself through Oedipus and castration? Or is it the psychoanalyst, the psychoanalyst in us all, who represents the unconscious in this way? For never has Engels' remark regained so much meaning. You'd think the psychoanalysts really believed in all this, in myth, in tragedy. They go on believing, whereas the Hellenists have long since stopped. One thing I just was going to note is that I, I said it in chat as I was reading this section. <clears throat> uh, I, as I was reading this paragraph, I was thinking to myself, Wow, this really sounds like they're going for the Nietzsche birth of tragedy, like for the throat. And then I just kind of put that in the back of my mind. And then it's just a few paragraphs later that they actually directly bring it up. So I think that is um, one of the reasons they're bringing up the Greeks and the Hellenists. Here we go. This is where it starts to get fun. And we're going to not be able to just jump to the next paragraph. Wait. Oh, one no. Second. I do have a question before you do make that jump. Oh, no. We were so close. I know. <laughs> Um, but I have to, you know, unfortunately succumb to the psychoanalyst in me in making that cut and, um, ask, well, what, a, what to make then of the psychoanalyst who tries to insert himself as a friend of mine, colleague here on, on this platform has pointed out to, um, to try to disrupt the unconscious edible complex. Could you ask that one more time? I, I think I, I missed the question. Okay, to distill it, it seems like the psychoanalyst inserts himself like a cut uh, for the dyad, the analysand, to begin a process of breaking him free of the unconscious edibilization. Yes, presupposing that, you know, a break is needed. Yeah, well, that's that's being presupposed here in the reading. So within that context, are you are you asking if psychoanalysts do this or should do this? I think I missed it. No, I think the the point is kind of elusive in this paragraph because they're pointing out the problematic with the psychoanalyst position um, and how many people maybe even unconsciously find themselves in the role of the psychoanalyst when dealing with gaining awareness around their edipalization or the familial. But the paradox here is that, um, you know, isn't, isn't it proclaimed that the psychoanalyst introduces himself, uh, 
through the process in order to uh, bring to awareness the unconscious edipalization. Is what you're saying that you, you, isn't it, is what you're saying that in psychoanalysis, this is the point, it, which is to draw out the, for the patient, the way in which they are unconsciously edipalizing things? Is that, is what, that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, so in that case, I would say that's, that is kind of what they're critiquing, because this, that entire model, as Rogers said, presumes that there is a, first, that there's like a, a sickness that needs to be uh, broken with. And I guess a lot of their critique is that what, you know, if you look at the unconscious as something that believes and that it's, it is a question of correcting false beliefs, you kind of end up in all of these dead ends that never really can ever be resolved because what's really happening underneath the surface are all these social and political investments that are being ignored. So you end up with this kind of permanent interminable psychoanalytic relationship that never resolves in anything other than the patient continuing to come to the psychoanalyst. That's, I guess, That's, I guess one of the more basic, basic uh, uh, approaches. Right. Well, extending it into the conversation around the social production, I think the edipalization and the familial um, is operating in the process of social production. So all these investments are true. Um, what you're saying, uh, take, for example, many family businesses, um, or yeah, I mean, I mean even the, the previous presidents and many presidents, uh, uh, just any family uh, infused business is an edipalized complex that deals with production. And as you say, there's all these various investments that are somehow um, blinding or, or the subject is blind to them because the drives um, are uh, constantly activated uh, by the edipalized familial. I mean, it's creating the drives so to social production, and I guess that's uh... well, not necessarily. That's exactly what they're critiquing. Is the like Roger said, the, the presupposition, or in, in their words that there is this belief of the unconscious in the, the Oedipal myth and tragedy that is constitutive here, right? Because what they're saying is, um, or at least what Deleuze and Guattari are, are getting at is, the, the unconscious isn't a question of how much it believes in the Oedipal, thereby the familial and this representation of itself, because the unconscious does not represent itself, right? It's more of a question of what the unconscious does, and this is going to be the thetic point for the um, uh, for schizoanalysis. So, if we can put it into a different manner, um, let's say let's say both are right or both are wrong. Um, it's it's just a question of ontology and how like what is being real in both of those uh, because the, the psychoanalysis would be one ontology and the criticism it's, 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 would be a, an alternative ontology to it. So the first one says that representations are within the unconscious, and if you want to fix something, you need to fix this attachment to the representation and how they create patterns within the individual. The other one says, no, it's not this. It's a chain of production that goes from the micro to the macro systems of society, and all those relations are producing desire. So you're, you're just getting two variations. And um, so basically what they're criticizing is that the creation of the psychoanalysis is that it's using its own ontology and prints it onto everything it sees and everything it touches. Like for example, the problem within the individual or the way we would see a Greek tragedy. So basically they're taking this, this constant and you know they're just applying it everywhere, trying to um, uh, device a tool to uh, intervene into the real because that's what they consider to be the real. All right. Um... Algman, does that help at all? I know you muted yourself. I want to make sure. Make sure. Yes, very much. Cool. cool. Thank you, guys. Oh, no, for sure. That's what we're here for. All right. Uh, now I am going to continue on to the next chapter, and I'll be damned if any question stops me. 
Uh, the Schreber case apl again applies. Schreber's father invented and fabricated astonishing little machines, sadistico-paranoiac machines. For example, head straps with a metallic shank and leather bands for restrictive use on children for making them straighten up and behave. These machines play no role whatever in the Freudian analysis. Perhaps it would have been more difficult to crush the entire socio-political content of Schreber's delirium if these desiring machines of the father had been taken into account, as well as their obvious participation in a pedagogical, pedagogical social machine in general. For the real question is this. Of course the father acts on the child's unconscious, but does he act as a head of family in an expressive Express familial tr transmission? Uh, I'm going to be careful with your mic there. Uh, let me start that section over. <clears throat> For the real question is this, of course the father acts on the child's unconscious, but does he act as a head of a family in an expressive familial transmission, or rather as the agent of a machine in a machinic information or communication? Schreber's desiring machines communicate with those of his father, but it is in this very way that they are from early childhood, the libidinal investment of a social field. In this field, the father has a role only as an agent of production and anti-production. Freud, on the contrary, chooses the first path. It is not the father who indicates the action of machines, but just the opposite. Therefore, there is no longer even any reason for considering machines, whether as desiring machines or as social machines. In return, the father will be inflated with all the forces of myth and religion and with phylogenesis, so as to ensure that the little familial representation has the appearance of being coextensive with the field of delirium. The production couple, the desiring machines and the social field, gives way to representative couple of an entirely different nature, family myth. Once again, have you ever seen a child at play? How he already populates the technical social machines with his own desiring machines? Oh, sexuality? Well, his father and or mother remains in the background, from whom the child borrows parts and gears according to his need and who are there as agents of transmission, reception and interception, kindly agents of production or suspicious agents of anti-production. This is gonna, we're gonna discuss a lot. The first thing I wanna go over is I just wanna go back to the first, second line, Schreber's father invented, fabricated, astonishing little machines. For those who can't see it, uh, Lou, post, had, Lou had posted, we went over this, uh, how awful Schreber's father's machines were. Uh, they are the kind of thing uh, you'd almost see in a movie about how not to raise children these days. Uh, little torture devices about standing up correctly, eating properly, having the right posture, standing with balance, uh, but with leather straps and uh, essentially S&M gear for children. It really creepy shit, to be frank. Um, but I liked the specific thing that I want to focus on here is that they didn't they didn't call these uh, these little bands or anything anything but little machines. They are sadistico paranoiac machines. Uh, they are the, the the definition of machine is the thing that produces, and they even apply it to these. So the idea of what machines are is so great. Yes, uh, and, and we're talking about those machines that's specific to children, but it's also in the era of the corset and, you know, the IELs for women and, you know, that were aimed at creating a certain type of body in society according to the desire that is not of the woman but of the man because they are projecting a certain standard of beauty uh, over those bodies. So that, that was a thing at the time. Well, and it's in it, and it, and the whole section it goes with. There's an old uh, Jesuit saying, "Give me a child for six years, you may have them after that." Old saying they used to have, uh, very much about how they're able to kind of create these little machines inside of children to get them producing and creating and moving in very specific directions, and how really those stick with you for a very, very long time. So I just want to make sure that we focus on like, because we've talked a lot about what are apparatuses or machines, what do they actually you know, what do they represent? What is the description of them? And here they're being very clear in how those take part in the desiring machine construction. Desiring machines ultimately build social fields. This kind of thing right here is almost that recipe for the entire setup. I want to say too, I like this. This is a really brilliant turn of the screw here where they're talking about 
okay, so you want to talk about the father. What about the father's little machines, right? But of course, these are social machines, right? So it's a really nice, it's a really nice critique and inversion of the Freudian while still putting it to its own task, right? And really where I'm getting, these machines play no role whatever in the Freudian analysis. So, right, like, it, you know, it's a nice, it's a nice critique of Freud while also affirming um, the losing lottery's argument. Yeah, I mean, it's not like the activities of the family don't plug into the creation of the social field, right? Oh, that's it's it's so sarcastic. <laughs> it's so sarcastic. They obviously, I mean, and it and it should be. I think we're even reading it almost comedically after when we first discovered Schreber's father. Like we were, I think we were almost live on stream when we were discussing it, and we were chatting about, oh, I found Schreber's father, and it's like. Holy shit! Look at what this guy fucking did. He's a lunatic. No wonder Schreber became this 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 guy. This poor dude from basically had no hope from birth. The way that this guy raised him, with these torture devices and everything. Like we we absolutely all reacted that way. And I think that's they're like, I mean, come on, guys. This whole thing. How are you not gonna? I guess it would have been more difficult to crush the entire social political content of Schreber's Valerium if you had actually looked at what these fucking torture devices that were used on him as machines and as part of his setup. I, they're, they're laughing about it there. Well, and with that delirium, just to make a quick point, with that delirium comes once again, the corporal punishment, these sadistical machines. This looks like a kind of revolutionary investment, sort of like Roger was saying with like, oh yes, well, this will improve your physique. This will make you desirable to the opposite sets. In this case, this will make you a better student. It'll improve your posture and all that, right? But it's a paranoiac investment at the same time. So right, we've talked about things that seem revolutionary but are actually reactionary, or it seems that uh, in the same way, this this sort of oscillation between the revolutionary and the reactionary here, I think is really nicely put within the Schreber case. I just wanted to say um, this last section in particular resonated with me when they're talking about the child at play um just anecdotally because i, I had to help i of... once was a child <laughs> yeah because you know a little known fact i myself was a child um no because uh, i had to a friend of mine was moving and they needed my, myself and my partner to mind their child who's two years old for a few hours in the morning uh just a day or two ago and we went to go take care of him and uh, just to summarize it quite quickly and for the first 15 minutes or so, I think he didn't realize his mom wasn't there. She gave the trade off. Then for the next about half hour, he was only, he just kept saying over and over again, mommy, where's mommy? See mommy, see mommy. But there was a sort of evolution over time. And the thing I love about this section, when it's saying, you know, how he populates the technical machines with his own desire machines, uh, the father and the mother remain in the background and the child borrowing parts and gears according to his need. You know, I, I think you could, if you wanted to talk about how diametrically opposed are the two different viewpoints, like you could take a psychoanalytic viewpoint and you could look at the entire interaction that we had with him from the point of view of this of this classical lack of like, oh, see, this is how, you know, and even though it's the mother, not quite the father, you can see how the child behaves and it doesn't have this connection. But as much as that is important to him, there were so many other things. Just it was fascinating observing all the connections he was making, the different b objects he chose to focus on. Eventually, he was able to sort of we were able to entertain him for a few hours. My point is, at, since then, I've gotten messages from my friend saying that he has been talking about us, but he can't seem to distinguish between me and my partner. So he's been talking about us as a single unit, which I also thought was fascinating. It's like there's no room for this kind of thing in a typical psycho psychoanalytic framework, like every subject has to be unique and entire and whole on, in and of themselves and they have to have clear and very traceable effects on each other subject in the whatever the triangle it is and it's it, it was just so radically not the case <laughs> we've you know we've entered into his that is oozing triangle as dng say in this very strange lateral uh, place and anyway i just i i appreciated this thing the father and mother in the background it was sort of this weird mongrel thing that had happened where me and my partner's name were meshed into one. And then he start, sort of stopped mentioning his parents. So it's just an, an anecdotal example. 
that is the exact scenario that grounds attachment research. They they do that with kids, and then they see how they react, and so yeah. I, am I the only person here with a kid? Am I the only breeder? I guess is what they call us now. I'm a hardcore kid, so I'm a kid until I die. Yeah, there we go. Um, I have to have a ship in a bottle. Watching uh, Dexter's three and uh, watching him and watching how other parents interact, uh, I mean, it, it absolutely is a really weird lens to be reading Anti Oedipus through after all of that and everything that goes with it. The last line of this section really gets to me. Uh, because it's awful to watch. Uh, kindly agents of production or suspicious agents of anti-production. Uh, the idea of uh, often, as they've talked about this throughout the book, uh, emotionally when I'm when they're talking about kind of production or anti-production, uh, I've felt uh, sort of uh, oh, anti-production could be really cool shit. That's that's where you're doing something interesting. That's uh, you know stopping this or that. They're, it's it's fascinating to me. But as I'm as with this, as I was reading this, and as we got deeper into this, uh, how how a lot of parents react with their kids and teach them deep repression so quickly and so early at two or three years old, and it's one of the strangest things to watch: uh, little girls in dresses, little boys in their outfits, people making comments because we don't. My wife and I don't really care about that, and Dexter loves tutus, and he is what he is. Um, it's a kindly agents of production or suspicious agents of anti-production is a interesting phrasing that really kind of got to me emotionally. Any questions on this paragraph before we move on? Uh, yeah, but uh, anti-production in that sense, are they also referring to repression of desire and rearrangement of desires uh, on the part of the parent to the child? Yeah, that's how I, that's how I read it, that it's, uh, Kindly agents of production or suspicious agents of anti-production. Uh, this this is from the child's perspective, basically. It's my desires are being made, learning how they're made. He talks about borrowing parts and gears according to his need, and that's absolutely what ki that kids that age are doing, is they're learning uh, how and what to desire because they don't have the ability to really formulate anything. Mm -hmm. And so as they borrow parts and gears from the parents, and like Dexter's playing with his Hot Wheels. And it's not that he's literally asking me for racetracks. He's looking to me for which, what should he be desiring? Should he be desiring loop-de-loops or not? That's a very simplistic version, but that's basically every day of his life. Uh, tell me what I'm supposed to be wanting. What am I supposed to be wanting? And uh, our job is basically to give them the tools to allow them to be producing desiring machines uh, to be producing dire desire the flows that are naturally coming or we can work as suspicious agents who do the opposite where we build and teach them to build things that repress it's, and it's it's, it's, it's really really something that happens a lot with kids and i did not realize how often parents do it a lot it's a lot so it's interesting that it's being put in that manner here, because uh, in other parts in Deleuze and Guattari, you'll see that anti-production is something that is, you know, almost considered to be positive, you know, as we would break the machinic assemblage of desire to create another one. But if it's seen here as a form of repression, but also a form of alienation, because, you know, saying you're not taking this gear, you're not taking this toy, you're not taking this, you're going to desire this instead. So alienation is being created um, within that family structure, not because of the, the, the representation, but because of the action of locking something away, of saying, no, you cannot do this. No, you cannot touch that. You need to rearrange your desire to be wanting this instead. But also I would say too with that, um, it's not necessarily the case that, um, so like part of the thing that's I think really cool here about their use of Schreber's father is here is Schreber's father, Helping his um, helping people plug into machines, right? So the plugging into, I don't think, is necessarily the normative good here, um, right? Because I don't. I, I at least I, I'm going to hope that um, we can agree that this kind of corporeal um, uh, production is not necessarily uh, good. But I would say too, like I think one of the the guiding sentences in this passage is, and this is 297. For the real question is this. Of course, the father acts on the child's unconscious, but does he act 
as a, as a head of the family in expressive familial transmission, or rather as the agent of a machine in a machinic information or communication, right? So do we take um, the father as a, a point of um, acting as the father in this way of familialism, right? Where there's this kind of triangulation, or is the father an agent um, of, of a machine, right? Whether it be production or anti-production, right? This is a, a question of how to understand the father sort of ontologically here. Well, that's, that's how I was understanding it in the sense that whether he's doing production or anti-production, that doesn't really matter as much as how he's doing it, if it's edipalizing or not. Yeah, he's part of the communicative chain between the, all of us. So from the, uh, the Lacanian perspective, vis-a-vis Chiesa, he points out early on that, um, that the investment of the father has a lot to do with bringing in an ego ideal uh, to regulate the, um, uh, the alienation or, or the, idea, the ego that's forming. So it's sort of the name of the father or the, um, just the application of providing uh, the uh, means of production. And as you guys point out, it, it could be one of two ways, negative or positive for now, but it's, you know, in the Lacanian sense, there is the desire for the father uh, to bring in various ideals um, into the child. Uh, and again, that, that could be a hypothesis that has sort of limited scope in terms of father-son relationships, whether it applies to father-daughter relationships, um, I don't know. Uh, but it spoke to me and I just thought maybe you guys might be able to, to um, elaborate on that because here I think it dovetails with that point around um, what is the contribution of the father uh, in terms of this machinic information or communication? According to Lacan, it is to regulate uh, by providing a um, the ideals for the ego. Um, yeah, so that um, it kind of uh, works on the narcissism that's being developed in the child. They do write a response to that kind of argument where they say, Freud, on the contrary, chooses the first path. It is not the father who indicates the action of machines, but just the opposite. Thereafter, there is no longer even any reason for considering machines, whether as desire machines or as social machines. In return, the father will be inflated with all these so-called forces of myth and religion and with phylogenesis so as to ensure that the little familial representation has the appearance of being coextensive with the field of delirium. So right, like the, the critique here that they're, they're, so they're anticipating that argument, um, I think that you just gave um, for Lacan and more directly for Freud here, that the, the father is not the, in this way, the father as father, sorry, the man who is father here is not the point of origin um, that all of this production and, and everything is sort of not only um, stemming from, but going back to in a regressive sense. An easy way to say it is the father is not the central um, unit here. The father is kind of the channeling of molar social forms. Mm -hmm. Well, I hear differences in the language, but I may have not uh, articulated it well enough to to say that these ideal, um, the ego ideals, I can't remember which one, but it's the reversal of the two terms. Uh, one, which is a multiplicity, I guess, um, and the effect on the ideal ego uh, sounds very similar to this, uh, the molar explanation that you gave the... So for me, um... The, in the writing uh, Molecular Revolution, 
uh, which is Quatri. Uh, it is impossible to separate the production of any consumer commodity from the institution that supports that production. The same can be said of teaching, training, research, etc. The state machine and the machine of oppression produce anti-production. That is to say, signifiers that exist to block and prevent the emergence of any subjective process. I would have a hard time arguing that blocking the subjective process in a child is a good thing, ever. I mean, I, you, we, we can disagree, but I'm saying that that's, their, that's the definition they used prior to the use of the term inside of anti-Oedipus. So, like, I, I, I tend to agree with that that happens to be the case, but I'm more saying that their definition of anti-production is literally that, that uh, signifiers that exist to block and prevent emergence of subjective process. That's what anti-production is. Yeah, and I and I think that you know we need to be careful not to read the text by our own lens. This was written at the point where we're still beating children, you know, we're still saying no upon everything, and there's physical punishment, you know, there's 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 hard consequences for not desiring in the way that society wants you to do it. I think. Can I talk? Yeah. Okay. Um, my understanding of anti-production was loosely based on the first chapter right and in the first chapter i got the impression that anti-production and production are kind of connected uh, like the um uh, conjunctive synthesis with the disjunctive synthesis and in that are not inherently bad but anti-production is is somehow linked to repression in a way that I do not really understand then. Uh, I, so in, in the use of it in desiring machines, desiring machines by nature, because of the process that you're talking about, uh, they, they do produce anti-production. Desiring machines produce, pro they have production and anti-production as their results. That's the nature of desiring machines. But we're not talking about desiring machines here. We're talking about the help of a... Uh, uh, the parent looking at a child and helping their subjective process by loaning them gears, by giving them parts to their desiring machines as the machines are being made. And with that, uh, that process is essentially helped as a parent by giving them essentially good or like, are we going to be pushing them towards repression? Because there are some things we have to do. I, I don't want him, you don't reach your hand into a boiling pot of water as a lesson that Dexter had to learn recently. You don't reach your hand into the open flame of a gas grill. Uh, fireplaces are hot. Fire as a thing is a thing we don't want to desire, like we desire it, but we can't reach out and grab it. So there's some points where obviously generalized repression is good but when we're talking about sort of creating anti-production from that of a suspicious parent figure which is the tone that they use and the wording they use i have a hard time saying that that feels like a really positive thing this is something maybe we we can spend debating but it's they're 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 phrasing around a lot of this anti-production i would be hard pressed to say is a like net positive as a thing I feel we're getting caught in the molar molecular thing because I feel you're right, Brooks, that actually the, they use the adjectives kindly and suspicious here, which does kind of point to the, the correct, I think, value judgment. But I think they mean insofar on the aspect of the social, insofar as it's their social investments, you could, I think, say it like that. I think it can get confusing when you're talking about it on a molecular level because I, I do think anti-production on a molecular level is, is a far more neutral thing. That isn't, agree with like, that. Yeah, that isn't like uh, it's not directed by a will and it's not something that is done in order to like deliberately to stop something. It's sort of this is how different processes end up shutting down. And the way I understand it, it's it's how a surface is created in the first place. You couldn't have a body without organs, without anti-production. So it may, maybe it's on the molar level that they're kind of wryly saying these suspicious agents of anti-production because it kind of fits with Traber's dad in that sense. Mm -hmm. think, uh, I'm suspicious also in the sense that you know they tend to act at certain moment it's not like a systematic acting so it's it's something that is always looking and watching to intervene but um just just one thing that's really easy because in their ontology i'm always going to say the ontology is <laughs> in quattery but i think it's it's important to keep that in mind what they what they have it's flux in materials 
you know and, and they're in the metaphysics of Deleuze it's that there's uh, there's forms but the forms are like secondary to this so flux and material so we can see production and anti-production as like a flow of water for example you allow the flow the flow will continue because it's an immanent reality it keeps flowing you know desire keeps flowing so you can just block it at one point and you know it's gonna reconfigure itself through the pipe of the possible and you know it's gonna re-emerge into another form so if if you always keep that kind of schema in your head it's really easy to understand and follow what they're trying to say I've made a specific note. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna end up doing multiple review sessions about this section. I have a feeling, but I've made a note. We're gonna go back over this because it's a worthwhile uh, section. I am gonna continue reading though because uh, I do want to get through more than three paragraphs today, uh, maybe four even. Um, here we go. <sighs> Why was mythic and tragic representation accorded such a senseless privilege? Why were expressive forms and a whole theater installed there where there were fields, workshops, factories, units of production? The psychoanalyst parks his circus in the dumbfounded unconscious, a real P.T. Barnum in the fields and in the factory. That is what Miller and already Lawrence have to say against psychoanalysis. The living are not believers. The seers do not believe in myth and tragedy. To quote... By retracing the paths to the earlier heroic life, you defeat the very element and quality of the heroic, for the hero never looks backward, nor does he ever doubt his powers. Hamlet was undoubtedly a hero to himself, and for every Hamlet born, there the only true course to pursue is the very course which Shakespeare describes. But the question, it seems to me, is this. Are we born Hamlets? Were you born a Hamlet? Or did you not rather create the type in yourself? Whether this be so or not, what seems infinitely more important is why revert to myth? This ideational rubbish out of which our world has erected its cultural edifice is now, by a critical irony, being given its poetic immolation, its mythos, through a kind of writing which, because it is of the disease and therefore beyond, clears the ground for fresh superstructures. In my own mind, the thought of fresh superstructure is abhorrent, but this is merely the awareness, awareness of a process and not the process itself. Actually, in process, I believe with each line I write that I am scouring the womb, giving it the curette, as it were. Behind the process lies the idea not of edifice and superstructure, which is culture and hence false, but of continuous birth, renewal, life, life. In the myth, there is no life for us. Only the myth lives in the myth. This ability to produce the myth is born out of awareness, out of ever-increasing consciousness. That is why, speaking of the schizophrenic nature of our age, I said, until the process is completed, the belly of the world shall be the third eye. Now, Brother Ambrose, just what did I mean by that? What could I mean, except that from this intellectual world in which we are swimming, there must body forth a new world. But this new world can only be bodied forth insofar as it is conceived, and to conceive there must first be desire. Desire is instinctual and holy. It is only through desire that we bring about the immaculate conception. Uh, if I can start like doing something on this, uh, when they're talking about uh, behind this process lies the ideas not of the edifice and superstructure. This is a clear criticism of Marxism at the time, which separated the material um, and the superstructure into a, a form of ideology. So society is being um, approached through ideology, through the ideas, and you know the infrastructure or like uh, any any mean in society is a result or an investment of this ideology. What they're saying here is that life does not need that. Life in itself does not need this kind of representation, does not need this ideological framework to function. So they want to liberate life from any kind of cookie cutting ideology that is being placed over the world. Uh, for me, I, I get a kick out of this because uh, I've actually, the first time I read through this, this, this stuck out of me. I was at the time I was working at Lucasfilm 
on Star Wars. Obviously, anything having to do with mocking the hero's journey, I love uh, because I do hate the conception of a lot of this shit, to say the least. Um, but a lot of this, I think, is speaking. It it, it speaks directly to I think a, a, an ethos of our own time that you just I just wanted to say uh, we were talking a moment ago about how though this time frame we're raising children it's, it's you got to remember this is the 60s I actually think this is probably more correct now than it was then talking about how mythos runs us and creates us I really really like this section I have a question here and it gets to a big question that I have with D&G in general which is you know what's the what's the role of the refrain uh what's the role of because they're not arguing, right, for, for pure sort of deterritorialization. Um, so what is the role of a belief or maybe even uh, a myth in a certain context at a certain point, right? Because we're always going to have heuristics. Well, I'm actually going to, uh, I'm going to put a pin in that and read the next paragraph because this was essentially, this whole thing was, uh, was Miller. The, this entire paragraph is essentially not from this book, and they're about to critique it and comment on it. Uh, I don't I don't mean critique in the they're critical of it. I think they agree with it, but they're going to build out on it. So I want to read the next paragraph, and then uh, I think we can then move to discussing that. So hold on for just a moment. Sound good? I'll say that's a yes. No problem. All right. Um, everything is said in these pages from Miller. Oedipus, or Hamlet, led to the point of autocritique. The expressive forms, myth and tragedy, denounced as conscious beliefs or illusions, nothing more than ideas. The necessity of a scouring of the unconscious, schizoanalysis as a curatage of the unconscious. The matrical fissure in opposition to the line of castration. The splendid, ad, splendid affirmation of the orphan and producer unconscious. The exaltation of the process as a schizophrenic process of deterritorialization that must produce a new earth. And even the functioning of the desiring machines against tragedy, against the fatal drama of the personality, against the inevitable confusion between mask and actor. It is obvious that Miller's correspondent, Michel Frankel, does not understand. He talks like a psychoanalyst or like a 19th century Hellenist. Yes, myth, tragedy, Oedipus, and Hamlet are good expressions, pregnant forms. They express the true permanent drama of desire and knowledge. Franco calls to his aid all the commonplaces, Schopenhauer and the Nietzsche of the birth of tragedy. He thinks Miller is unaware of these things and never wonders for a second why Nietzsche himself broke with the birth of tragedy, why he stopped believing in tragic representation. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to relate it, um, but just generally, you know, interested in uh, the potential role of myth, the potential role of belief, um, you know, for any sort of territorialization, necessary territorialization of human life, human subjectivity. So I think some of the answer to your question is in there, is actually in the Miller. Um, it's hard to call this a quote since it's like a paragraph and, and more than that, since it's stitching together separate paragraphs. But um, anyways, I think where Miller writes, but the question seems to me is this, are we born Hamlets? Were you born Hamlet? Or did you not rather create the type in yourself? Whether this be so or not, what seems infinitely more important is why revert to myth? So, right, like part of what Miller is getting at here is like, this is regression, right? You're, you're making a Hamlet out of yourself um, or more so like you're making an Oedipus out of yourself, right? So this is, this is definitely a problematic with myth as it becomes a, a lens to kind of, or at least when myth becomes a way of taking you out of what's going on, out of the event, to be sort of octane about it the myth is kind of, it's got, definitely got a huge flaw there, right? But I think where they're getting, where Miller kind of begins to provide some answer to your question is um, the ability to produce the myth is born out of awareness, out of ever increasing consciousness. That is why speaking of the schizophrenic nature of our age, I said, quote, until the process is completed, the belly of the world shall be the third eye. 
and he, he goes on a little bit more, but I think what they're getting at um, with this this look at Miller is that, um, and, and they talk about this with the third synthesis, right? When we talk about simulating um, subjectivities in that, when we talk about Columbus simulating a horde, um, well, simulating an admiral, so I think it's he simulates an admiral simulating a whore. He had to appease his crew and all that. This kind of theatrics, it's, I don't think they're saying it's not there. I think what they're saying is the production of these theatrics and this theatrical production and the way myth plays into that is not so like overlaying. It's more like, it's more of a way of talking about what's going on and without losing the way, um, the focus on what's going on in the event. Uh, one thing I was just going to say was I think this is this section, it's re- it is kind of important, I think, to situate it in that conversation with Birth of Tragedy, because even in the previous bit where they were talking about a bit earlier, when they were talking about the Hellenists, like, I think that that Birth of Tragedy is a great example. You have the discipline of like philology you have all these different people writing about obsessed with ancient Greece, and all the different philosophy that and art that comes out of it. And you have someone like Nietzsche come along and he writes the tragedy. And it's in many ways, especially to our modern eyes, we can look back at it and see what was brilliant about it. But it was pretty much roundly rejected by all of his colleagues and, and ridiculed. And I think what's as it was sort of redeemed over time and became like a darling of critical philosophy, there's reasons for that because you can see in it, like it's sort of like what they're saying about uh, later on, they talk about uh, Freud and Ricardo, where they say the brilliant thing that Ricardo did is discovering the abstract subjective essence of labor and then understanding it as a process. And then Freud kind of initially did that. And then, but then he kind of lost it a little bit with all the myth and tragedy and representation stuff. You know, the Nietzsche stuff is similar because if you, if you want to read birth of tragedy uncharitably, we, we had a whole session on this a while back of two sessions, I think, uh, you know, it, it is kind of incoherent and you can read it. It, it reads very like proto psychological in a way, proto psychoanalytical. There's all these very, you know, it's like, it's like Deleuze and Guattari are saying like, do the Hellenists even believe what they're, they themselves are writing? Do they believe that the Greeks somehow didn't behave in the way that they believed, or, you know, or didn't think in the way they believed? It's a whole very, very complicated system for getting at some of the very basic stuff that he's talking about, which is sort of the limits of reason, the limits of human reason, music, uh, science, all these different things. So I think it's it is a great example because talking about Dionysian and Apollonian art and all this stuff, it's it's a really fun framework for talking about things, but it is extremely limited, and it, and is totally contingent upon this fiction that ancient Greece kind of existed in this way, as that Nietzsche is saying, and that you kind of just have to take that when when really it's all, Nietzsche is basically talking about his own society, you know. So even though he repudiated it later in his life like i think there's still a lot to be got that you can get out of it if you understand it through the lens of him sort of writing about just our, our own societies or his society at the time so that's just why i'm thinking it might be helpful in, in our conversation to remember that to add very briefly to that one of the major i think problems and sort of like this is almost a unique thing about the birth of tragedy and the nietzschean corpus is it almost lends itself to a certain structuralist reading which is that the the process of art, right? The metaphysics of art that he's trying to lay out um, sort of exists within this um, duplexity of the Apollonian and the um, the Dionysian in this kind of exclusive way, which is that why I think Deleuze and Guadagno, and I, I think they have a point here, calling it a tragic representation. So would it, would it maybe be accurate to say that there's a, a molar and a molecular way of doing myth to some degree? I'm not sure the answer to that, but I did what I said in the chat earlier. I don't know if it helps is that that phrase auto critique. That seems to me to be always what like the delusion move that they, he's trying to make, like bringing philosophy to the point of its own imminent critique, bringing myths to the point of their auto critique, like insofar as they exist, because they do say throughout edipalization does happen, but it doesn't happen in the way we normally think it happens. So maybe one way of looking at it would be it's a question of intervening and bringing those very myths to the point of their auto critique to then, you know, try and escape in some other line of flight. That would be my guess, but I don't know if that's an adequate answer. Uh, I'd like I'd like to mention something, which is that uh, this question: Why revert to myth? So I'd like to recommend a book uh, by Hattab called "Myth and Philosophy," where he differentiates 
differentiates between the myth the myth the mythic era mythopoetic era and the metaphysical era that started around the time of uh, uh, Thales and Anaximander and we're still in the metaphysical era <clears throat> but one of the um, uh, characteristics of the metaphysical era is a nostalgia for the mythic so the answer an answer to why revert to myth is because the metaphysical era is um, nostalgic for the for the mythos that was produced just spontaneously in the mythopoetic era. But I think they're yeah. kind of reeling against the idea of reverting to the mythological, at least in the sense that there's almost an inversion going on here, right? If the mythological is a way of taking us out of the world and kind of just like with psychoanalysis, right? Explaining what's going on, or even with Marxism, explaining what's going on exclusively through um, what we commonly call a diagram, through the story that exists apart from us, as though we are Hamlet in in the sense of the uh, the book and not in what we're experiencing the event, the myth has a fatal flaw. But if we're talking about myth in the moment, right, if we're talking about myth as we're already doing it in terms of like a, a sort of storytelling or an authoring, then I see myth as having actual potential. Well, the the thing is that what this brings up with their reference to the the, the new world is that you know um, philosophers have been talking a long time about what's after the metaphysical era. Uh, Heidegger tried to pin Nietzsche down as the last metaphysician and tried to create a philosophy that was after the metaphysical era. And so this question of what what it is it that is the next era. Uh, you know, that is emergently going to transform from the metaphysical era. Um, what's interesting about that is that whatever that is, probably what it's going to have is a nostalgia for the metaphysical. Roger, I didn't mean to cut you off. I know you had a comment. Could you um, give your comment? And then if there's no further discussion, we'll move into the next paragraph. No, let's go ahead. Okay. Um, let me see here. We were on the paragraph Michel Foucault, 299. Michel Foucault has convincingly shown what break Copier maybe introduced. There we go, Roger. You're going to be our, our French voice. Michel oh, Foucault has convincingly shown what break Sacre Bleu introduced the eruption of production into the world of representation. Production can be that of labor or that of desire. It can be social or desiring. It calls forth forces that no longer permit themselves to be contained in representation. And it calls forth flows and breaks that break through representation, traversing it through and through, quote, an immense expanse of shade, end quote, extended beneath the level of representation. And this collapse or sinking of the classical world of representation is assigned a date by Foucault, the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th. So it seems that the situation is far more complex than we made it out to be, since psychoanalysis parti participates to the highest degree in this discovery of the units of production, which subjugate all possible representations rather than being subordinated to them. Just as Ricardo founds political or social economy by discovering quantitative labor as the principle of every representable value. Freud founds desiring economy by discovering the quantitative libido as the principle of every representation of the objects and aims of desire. Freud discovers the subjective nature or abstract essence of desire, just as Ricardo discovers the subject nature or abstract essence of labor, beyond all representations that would bind it to objects, to aims, or even to particular sources. Freud is thus first to disengage desire itself, le désir tout court, as Ricardo disengages labor itself, le travail tout court, and thereby the sphere of production that effectively eclipses representation, and subjective abstract desire like subjective abstract labor, is inseparable from a movement of deterritorialization that discovers the interplay of machines and their agents underneath all the specific determinations that still linked desire or labor 
to a given person, to a given object, and the framework of representation. I suppose the first question is where to begin, right? <laughs> Alyosha, you had some thoughts on uh, Ricardo here, I think. I don't think there's a lot to say. I was just, I was kind of making the hot take argument that it, it, in one way to understand the, the Nietzsche stuff is because, because, you know, Deleuze is a big fan of Nietzsche as well, but it is what was good about birth of tragedy. Wasn't the actual m arguments it was making or the, the creation of new myths to overlay the old myths, the Apollonian and Dionysian or any of that. It was a sort of hinting at a, a subjective as, you know, abstract essence of desire potentially. So I was just um, going through my notes. I was finding some quotes from Birth of Tragedy that I thought might be helpful in that sense. But beyond that, I don't think I have a lot to say. What okay. I can ask as a question is the, um, it starts with Michel Foucault and he says that he talks of a break. It's an epistemic break. You know, it's a, it's a shift in episteme. But what I'm asking on this is like, you know, he says that we... We pass, you know, there's an eruption of production into the world of representation. I'm just asking when, you know, which, when did that break happen? Because they're not, they don't, they don't seem to be saying it. Uh, it looks like, and this collapse or sinking of the classical world of representation is assigned a date by Foucault, the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. I looked at the footnote. I think it's from the order of things. I can't speak on that because I haven't read it, but I'm guessing knowing Foucault, I mean, they, they talk about that and they talk about Freud. That That is the era. That's the birth of, you know, psychoanalysis. So. Okay, yeah. Because it, it would link it to the, the birth of liberalism also, but I'm, I don't know. It's like the eruption of production into the world of representation. Like, everything was representation before. The The... The divine state or, you know, uh, the sovereign state was not really a thing of representation. It was more transcendental. Oh, okay, I get it. So basically what they're saying is that the, the production emerge as an imminent force, force within the transcendent order given by the idea that the king was the representation of the divine on earth. Okay, okay, I get it. Yeah, uh, I'm not missing. And this is about when capitalism happens too. So like with that, um, to your point, right? Like the productive force is now entering the, the, um, the representation. So, right. Like I get I, this calls to mind kind of like the image you're painting Roger, where we're looking at the representation as the productive and production happening there. Yeah. And, you know, it links to the governmentality, rise of biopolitics and everything. The switch, because <clears throat> they're talking, he's talking mainly about the physiocrats and how like a new form of government was able to rise out of understanding nature instead of like, you know, making the divine um, will on Earth. So there was a difference there. So, so it <laughs> is in Foucault, the order of things and in the order of things, they have four different epistemes. Um, the first one is the Renaissance. And then the second one he calls the classical era, but he means the era of Descartes and Spinoza and Leibniz. And, uh, and so it's that third one, and I don't remember what it was called. But then the fourth one is supposed to be the one of the future. I don't remember what the third one's called. I think it's modern, but I can't remember. Anyway, it's interesting to compare uh, like Kuhn's idea of paradigms to uh, uh, Foucault's idea of epistemes and Heidegger's ideas of the different epics of being, because basically they're models of discon discontinuities in history at different levels of abstraction. And this moves us toward Algman's question. Can someone clarify what they mean by the quantitative libido? Is this more figurative than quantifiable? So I think what they're getting at is exactly what we're describing um, with the the episteme and, and um, production imploding into it, um, which is to say, like, with the, with the, so like with Ricardian labor value, right, production appears to be in the abstraction of uh, labor, right? So this is where we're getting into that the capitalist machine more directly now um so with that right like i think what he what they're they're trying to explain here is like 
with the quantitative libido and with the, the quantitative labor, um, production is now seeming to be in the representation. And it's sort of um, caught up in here apart from us in the same way that we kind of talked about myth as being thought of um, uh, sort of apart from us. So uh, bear with me here, but in, in Foucault, uh, I think it's, you know, in, in the classical period, in the modern period, maybe somewhere in between there, he talks about how we start ordering life and ordering understanding through different disciplines of understanding, basically. So you, you have a young uh, uh, Adam, Adam Smith understanding of like material life to like economics or whatever. So I'm, I'm guessing, you know, uh, quantitative libido has something to do with the episteme that gets started around that time. Um, having to do with, you know, how we're, we're seeing subjectivity as a table, a representative table. Yeah, the, the part that does it for me is where they say the, these essences exist uh, detached from objects, aims, interests, right? All this, th th this quantification exists literally apart from everything it's, it ought to be connected to, to actually be like, um, you know, kind of a more meaningful. It, it might relate to biopower for Foucault. Anyone have any other thoughts on this paragraph before we move into the next one? Yeah, I just look, I found a place where it talks about labor, life, and language, the modern episteme. I think that's, that's what he's talking about. Desiring production and machines, psychic apparatuses, and machines of desire, desiring machines, and the assembling of an analytic machine suited to decode them. The domain of free syntheses where everything is possible. Partial connections, included disjunctions, nomadic conjunctions, polyvocal flows and chains, transductive breaks. The relation of desiring machines is formations of the unconscious with the molar formations that they constitute statistically in organized crowds and the apparatus of social and psychic repression resulting from these formations, such is the composition of the analytic field. And this sub-representative field will continue to survive and work, even through Oedipus, even through myth and tragedy, which nevertheless mark the reconciliation of psychoanalysis with representation. The fact remains that a conflict cuts across the whole of psychoanalysis. The conflict between mythic and tragic familial representation and social and desiring production. For myth and tragedy are systems of symbolic representations that still refer desire to determinate exterior conditions, as well as to particular objective codes, the body of the earth, the despotic body, and that in this way confound the discovery of the abstract or subjective essence. It has been remarked in this context that each time Freud brings to the fore the study of the psychic apparatuses, the social and desire machines, the mechanisms of the drives, and the institutional mechanisms, his interest in myth and tragedy tends to diminish, while at the same time he denounces in Jung, then in Rank, the reestablishment of an exterior representation of the essence of desire as an objective desire, alienated in myth or tragedy. So when he says, mark the recon reconciliation of psychoanalysis with representation, and he was saying that representation was from the past episteme, and so basically psychoanalysis would do a regression into the classical, and yeah, so basically they're saying that it's archaic in, in, a, in a sense, or like it's linked to another form of understanding. Yeah, and in this way, I think this is kind of important for schizoanalysis and the, the discussion of psychoanalysis to its own autocritique, is that it seems like Freud comes close at times, doesn't it? I think it's also, I pasted that paragraph from page 270 just earlier in the chat, and I think um, just the first part of it could be helpful because, again, they're talking about Adam Smith and Ricardo here, and they point to the same thing. Uh, they say the merit of Adam Smith and Ricardo was to have determined the essence or nature of wealth no longer as an objective nature, but as an abstract and deterritorialized subjective essence, the activity of production in general. But as this determination develops under the condition of capitalism, 
They objectify the essence all over again. They alienate and re-territorialize it, this time in the form of private ownership of the means of production. And I think this is kind of the thing here. It's that in, initially, the, that is the insight of psychoanalysis to finally discover that abstract subjective desire. But because it can't conceive of desire as productive in and of itself, and it always has to refer to some exterior, it becomes re-territorialized. And then, yeah, so it, it's not that it's always initially, I would say initially it wasn't necessarily archaic, like you're saying, Roger, but it essentially becomes so because it has to be re-territorialized in some way. And then it's sort of it's in its inherent insight is almost lost. And I think they lost, I mean, and they they go on in later paragraphs to talk about dreams and fantasy. And it's almost like the the private the dreams become the private property in this framework. You know, it has to be an individual conception of dreams. And uh yeah, I, I think we'll get to that if we get to those paragraphs today. Let's go with that. Any final thoughts here? A loud bang. Would anyone like to read the next paragraph? Your voice is so lovely. Don't you sweet talk me, Roger. I sweet talk everybody. I bet you say that to all the women. And the men as well. <laughs> Alright, then I'll keep going for, for the sake of Roger's pleasure. Um, how can this very complex ambivalence... Wait a second. Okay, yeah. How can this very complex ambivalence of psychoanalysis be explained? Several different things must be distinguished. In the first place, symbolic representation indeed grasps the essence of desire, but by referring it to large so-called object objectities. Objectity. There's my pleasure. As to the specific elements that determine its objects, aims, and sources. It is in this way that myth ascribes desire to the element of the earth as a full body and to the territorial code that distributes prescriptions and prohibitions. Likewise, tragedy ascribes desire to the full body of the despot and to the corresponding imperial code. Consequently, the understanding of symbolic representations may consist in a systematic phenomenology of these elements and objectities, as in the old Hellenists or even Jung, or else these representations may be understood by historical study that assigns them to their real and objective social conditions, as with recent Hellenists. Viewed in the latter fashion, representation implies a certain lag and expresses less a stable element than the condition passage from one element to another. Mythic representation does not express the element of the earth, but rather the conditions under which this element fades before the despotic element. And tragic representation does not express the despotic element, properly speaking, but the conditions under which, in 5th century Greece, for example, this element diminishes in favor of the new order of the city-state. It is obvious that neither one of these ways of treating myth or tragedy is suited to the psychoanalytic approach. The psychoanalytic method is quite different. Rather than referring symbolic representation to determinate objectities and to objective social conditions, psychoanalysis refers to the subjective and universal essence of desire as libido. Thus, the operation of decoding in psychoanalysis can no longer signify what it signifies in the sciences of man, the discovery of the secret of such and such a code. Psychoanalysis must undo the codes so as to attain the quantitative and qualitative flows of libido that traverse dreams, fantasies, and pathological formations, as well as myth, tragedy, and the social formations. Psychoanalytic interpretation does not consist in competing with codes, adding a code to the codes already recognized, but in decoding in an absolute way, in eliciting something that is uncodable by virtue of its polymorphism and its polyvocity. It appears, then, that the interest psychoanalysis has in myth, or in tragedy, is an essentially critical interest, since the specificity of myth understood objectively, must melt under the rays of the subjective libido. It is indeed 
the world of representation that crumbles or tends to crumble. So there we go. Now we know psychoanalysis. Uh, this is why it has the advantage. Uh, psychoanalysis has a lag switch. So what do you guys make of this paragraph? Uh, for instance, one thing that interests me is um, psychoanalysis must undo the code so as to attain the quantitative and qualitative flows of libido that traverse dreams, fantasies, and pathological formations, as well as myth, tragedy, and the social formations. This, like, this consideration of psychoanalysis as decoding, in this way, it actually reminds me of socius of capital. Yeah, and I would like to go back to something at the middle of the paragraph when they say, viewed in the later latter fashion, representation implies a certain lag and expresses a less stable element than the conditioned passage from one element to another. So basically, what they're, when they're talking about myth, myth is not something that is a priori, you know, in society, it's something that is a posteriori in the sense that myth can only be erected when something is already vanishing, as representation can only like be stated after uh, the object that it refers to is deteriorating in the sense that, you know, you're not capturing the object in itself, but like you make a representation of it, but you, you've you already left it. So the myth is um, expressing a certain trouble because it refers to a past as it's present, but it, it says that, you know, it's always something that is shifty and can crumble, but it's because it's already crumbling. And they're, they're putting it into an historical timeline, saying that uh, myth does not express the element of the earth, but rather the condition under which this elements phase before the despotic element. So basically, there's, the, there's all the states of society, and the myth or the tragic representation happens, you know, after a certain moment is already passing. I don't know if you, you follow this, like in a, if we put it on like a timeline that is dialectic, you're going to have, you know, reality, myth, reality, tragedy, reality, city state. And, you know, we can go on like this. So for example, the myth that we would have today or the meta narratives or anything that explains reality would be something that explains a reality that is already passing. Yeah, I really, yeah, I really like, like I don't know if I'll just say my thing Pete, quickly, Algman. Um, I just really like this section and I was saying the same in the chat that I love pointing to representation in this way because it kind of solves the problem, I think, of what people see in, in their criticism because you could say, well, you're just inverting representation. They're saying, well, it's not that because representation, it, it actually exists and it emerges, but it only emerges at points of tension and differentiation. So rather than being something stable, which signifies on its own, it's something which emerges, you know, so like sort of like Roger was saying, like at, at a point of at a vanishing point between systems. I mean, you could take it on many different levels. It could be about language itself. I think it's a great way to look at. I mean, even if you think of our contemporary reality, like uh, the idea of welfare queens or whatever it is, it's like these are it's myths and ideas that even as they exist, are already referring to realities that proceed far precede our current situation and are most likely already dying. So I think this section is very much, again, in that it's like, it is a major critique of that whole birth of tragedy thing in that, again, it's like, like they were saying earlier about Ricardo and, and Freud, there's something, there's something new he... that is important, but then it gets reified again because he takes those representations almost too seriously and treats them as uh, he reifies them essentially. So, yeah. I would just, uh, you know, reiterate the the point before a little bit and say that I, I do think there's a difference between um, kind of a process-oriented collective storytelling, you could even say myth-making maybe, and then this kind of representative, representational approach. I, I want to go back to Alyosha's um, point too, because... One thing that strikes me here is kind of like with with this consideration of psychoanalysis as decoding for the sake of the quantifiable and that, right? This also has a critique for Marxism, and I think this is in part why they're looking at Ricardo here, right? Because, yeah, we can get at the essence of labor value, right? And we can start talking about 
um, surplus value and labor value in this quantified way in that. And that's not necessarily wrong, but is that really going to help us do something revolutionary? Are we going to be able to make a revolutionary investment by focusing on the, um, on this abstract essence? Yeah. And in that case, you know, that's the, they, they discover the abstract essence and then they say, but what creates the abstract essence is actually private property and capital. So it's like the, it's it, capital's own BWO is fallen back on, on the thing that's actually creating labor value that Mark sort of later discovers and appropriating it to itself. Exactly. We would be better off to let the decoding and all of this um, with, the, as they say, the world of representation that crumbles or tends to crumble. Right, with that crumbling, I think we might be a little bit better off in some sense. It's tricky for me. Um, just you know, as an example, if if I'm working at Laborde or I'm I'm doing something like that, uh, there may be some value in in the myth of a community, even if we haven't really formed a community on a kind of molecular level. Um, but the the myth, the molar myth could sort of uh, create a temporary cohesion that allows us to work at a molecular molecular level or something like that. So, I mean, maybe this just goes back to the whole, like, the rhizomes feed into the, the arborescent structures and vice versa. Yeah, the, the myth can always have, like, a double function, you know? It can, it can <laughs> serve as the form of enterprise production, but also a form of production in the sense that when you're into an era and you refer to... Uh, the past you can use the past to actually transform the present so you know it's really depending on how it enters the assemblage you know and i think that that can make sense of like you know the function of the myth the function of the story the function of essences or whatever else we want it's really the how we place them into uh, the essence out uh, into the assemblage and how they plug in but they they don't have an essence in themselves you know yeah, and that's and I, I think you're right about Jung having a, a structural understanding. And I, you know, I'm a big fan of James Hillman, the post-Jungian, who I, I think has a far less reified, far less structural understanding of archetypes, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, just to say too, Mike, I think this might be where they're getting. I, I haven't read this book before, but I, my sense is as they're moving to their conclusion, this is where they're going to start talking about sort of revolutionary investments and the potential for what would be a, a counter investment you know so you bring these things to their auto critique you you are able to deconstruct it and then how do you reinvest it in a in a way that is conscious and i remember there was a section earlier way earlier in the book where they talk about group fantasies which was very much Qatari's thing about the the the, the board clinic of like how to look at things from the perspective of group fantasy so there's clearly some frameworks that he believed in pushing i just think it's about yeah how do they operate as opposed to unconsciously produced ones or ones that are produced by the social just sort of as as it exists versus ones that are consciously produced as a form of resistance i guess any final thoughts before we move on my siren song as long as it's not my swan song galiosha it looks like i've been elected to keep reading so you'll have to suffer through this it follows that, in the second place, the link between psychoanalysis and capitalism is no less profound than that between political economy and capitalism. The discovery of the, uh, excuse me, this discovery of the decoded and deterritorialized flows is the same as that which takes place for political economy and in social production in the form of subjective abstract labor and for psychoanalysis and in desiring production in the form of subjective abstract libido. As Marx says, in capitalism, the essence becomes subjective, the activity of product, production in general, and abstract labor becomes something real from which all the preceding social formations can be reinterpreted from the point of view of a generalized decoding or a generalized process of deterritorialization. Quote, the simplest abstraction, then, which modern economics places at the head of its discussions, and which expresses an immeasurably ancient relation, valid in all forms of society, nevertheless achieves practical truth 
as an abstraction only, as a category of the most modern society. This is also the case for desire, sorry, end quote. This is also the case for desire as abstract libido and as subjective essence. Not that a simple parallelism should be drawn between capitalist social production and desiring production, or between the flows of money capital and the shift flows of desire. The relationship is much closer. Desire machines are in social machines and nowhere else. So that the conjunction of the decoded flows in the capitalist machine tends to liberate the free figures of a universal subjective libido. In short, the discovery and adaptivity of production in general and without distinction, as it appears in capitalism, is the identical discovery of both political economy and psychoanalysis beyond the determinant systems of representation. All right, right shift flows of desire. desire. So is it saying that there's basically uh, similar recipes or uh, underlying algorithms for all three? Political economy, psychoanalysis, and... Uh, uh, there should be because in a thousand plateau, that's what they would say that there's a uh, the abstract machine or the abstract diagram that is over everything. You know, it's like a, it's like a pattern. It's like this 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 abstract pattern that um, institutions or you know domains of truth are are um, responding to. Oh boy, not a lot of thoughts on this one, huh? <laughs> No, but yep. it's, I think it's important, like the simplest abstraction, you know, it's an abstraction. It's a, it's something that is, you know, it's not the, the, it's not the concrete reality. It's something that is abstracted then which modern economics place at the end of its discussion. So basically they have this mechanics, this logic and which expresses an immeasurably ancient relation valid in all forms of society in the sense, holy shit, stop sending me messages. Um, you know, they place it there. Nevertheless, achieves practical truth as an abstraction only as a category of the most modern society. So it 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 become it becomes uh, an, uh, like a the, it has the same function as the myth. You know, it becomes the explanation. So the, this abstraction is the mythical explanation of capitalism. Yeah, and this kind of archaism becomes a sort of um, anachronism, right? Like we're we're bringing. We're trying to explain where we are today in terms of like um, these sort of like these, these sort of um, I don't want to call them archaisms per se, but these figures um, that precede all of it. Or rather, let me try that again. That that is tied together through the um, through the abstract um, signifier, I guess, for lack of a better word here, where they say the simplest yes. abstraction then sits at the helm. Go ahead, Roger. Yeah, so the signifier is not before. Signifier comes after, you know, because things are happening without the need of a signifier. So they put the signifier into the abstract to uh, re-encode everything and to explain it. But, it, it, you know, reality does not respond to something in the ether. You know, it's never like that. We're not into the transcendent anymore. We're in a pure, imminent form that everything arises and then discourse is being put on top. Should uh, Jack, do you want to break? Should I should I read for a minute or? I ran out of tea several several minutes ago, so yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> cool. <clears throat> Obviously, this does not mean that the capitalist being or the being in capitalism desires to work or that he works according to his desire. But the identity of desire and labor is not a myth. It is rather the active utopia par excellence that designates the capitalist limit to be overcome through desiring production. But why precisely is desiring production situated at the always counteracted limit of capitalism? Why, at the same time as it discovers the subjective essence of desire and labor, a common essence inasmuch as it is the activity of production in general, is capitalism continually re-alienating this essence, and without interruption, in a repressive machine that divides the essence in two and maintains it divided, abstract labor on the one hand, abstract desire on the other, political economy and psychoanalysis, political economy and libidinal economy. Here we are able to appreciate the full extent to which psychoanalysis belongs to capitalism. For as we have seen, capitalism indeed has as its limit the decoded flows of desiring production, 
but it never stops repelling them by binding them in an axiomatic that takes the place of the codes. Capitalism is inseparable from the movement of deterritorialization, but this movement is ex exorcised through factitious and artificial re-territorializations. Capitalism is constructed on the ruins of the territorial and the despotic, the mythic and the tragic representations, but it reestablishes them in its own service and in another form as images of capital. And I like that once again we're seeing that right psychoanalysis occurs um, under capitalism. Yeah, so we talked about with like um, uh, the 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 episteme that uh, Foucault was focusing on. If I'm I'm going to take a guess and venture that with that we're we're seeing a psychoanalysis taking birth at that time, or at least starting to come into being. I have a question uh, sort of about axiomatics. I don't, I don't remember a lot of the earlier discussion in the book about them from looking at it here in my head, I'm understanding an axiomatic cause I, cause I remember them talking about capitalism enforcing different axiomatics, but so here, if it takes the place of a code that, you know, the, the codes and the decoding, that's sort of what's happening. That's like the, uh, I don't know, the froth or whatever. That's the stuff that's always happening beneath the surface. So an axiomatic then it's is not quite an ideology, right? It's different from that because that's kind of more again world of representation and sort of signifier signified. But it's it's I guess is it it's some framework, some way of operating that allows the codes to be obscured. Is that correct? The axiomatic, axiomatic. Is, like, the axiomatic is like a series of assumptions. With, with yes, the, 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 the assumptions, uh, and they are linked to either like theorems, models, or realization. You know, there, there's it. It places the whole order of the scores. Yeah, so I was thinking in the simpler model of uh, the axiomatics being the logic, uh, and that the codes and decodes is the data that's being produced. As I as I was thinking about it, um, the axiomatic is something that is sort of like uh, sort of glued to capital in a sense, I guess, right? Because it's not it's not a code per se, but the axiomatic to me seems to be something that one nobody is going to disagree with, and two has a way of coding and decoding. So, like when I think about it, I think about like um, I don't want to be way burdening about it, but to like you know, the Ben Franklin uh, sort of aphorisms, right? Uh, a penny saved is a penny earned. That has a way of coding and decoding, and it's something that I don't think anybody's going to disagree with. But at the same time, as an axiom, you can see that there's a, a clear limit to it, which is that, um, right, a, a, do you have any pennies? You know, like, how'd you get the pennies? It, it, it literally... Um, raises more questions than it answers, right? And that's kind of the, the point about it, is it's it's a way of kind of um, quashing, but also redirecting discourse in that sense. So the the axiomatic uh, is a, you know, a series of uh, statements that are kind of like unmotivated that produce a, uh, you know, a complex, a, a convex field in which you know you can derive theorems from those axioms well it's, and... it's actually i the the first ones there is i think the one that's most important because when you say that they uh, almost have no drives behind behind them that they are they they just are things that exist neutrally that's i think their critique and the use of the word axiomatic in a lot of what they talk about with capital because these are these axiomatics are truths that we assume are just sort of part of nature and science and axiomatic is uh oh the light comes from the sun there we go real basic thing everything else we can kind of figure out and we build off these axioms for them in capital we have these same sort of rules about how capitalism works and how the world around us works that we tend to believe have this same sort of neutrality even though they're not they're literally things that are built in service of the the capitalist system yes and because they uh they just refer sorry to, to interrupt to... Kent. sorry but yeah it's, it's no it's good it's, it's exactly what it is and since they referred to foucault uh previously in the rise of uh 
of the physiocrat, it was an understanding of nature. So capitalism becomes like, you know, letting nature like do itself. So, you know, the, the axioms were trying to decipher how nature was working and how capitalism was a form of like, you know, extirpate or like take, you know, take the economy outside of the sovereign to place it into a state of nature. So the axiom of capitalism are axiom based on naturalistic account. Yeah. And that's why I like the Ben Franklin example, right? Once again, why should I, why should I want pennies? Why do I want pennies? Why do I want to, you know, all these questions come up, but at the same time, there's almost this wave of reassurance, right? That he's, he's, he's right. Well, I should save my money. You know, it's got this way of, even though you're not in that discourse, it's got a way of sort of supplanting um, potential discourses otherwise. But so can I, I, again, this is helpful, but does that make sense? Makes sense. Asking in the chat. Does that, this sort of seems to me to replace the concept of ideology. Would, would you agree or no? The first thing I would say is an ideology seems to be a much more of a whole than an axiom, whereas an axiom seems to be able to exist, like the Ben Franklin example. I usually think of ideologies as like these complex structures. That's fair. You could almost say it's a almost nodal type of ideology, where it's, see, the reason I like the term ideology is because in psychoanalytics, in common parlance, ideology has finally entered the mainstream sort of conversation as a thing people know exists now. And so being able to utilize that language, I think, is yeah, and also because I love Zizek. That's the fuck you, Alyosha, that's true. But I, I think, <laughs> tonally, I think it works because I think when you say, like, we're talking about the ideologies of capitalism, we don't mean necessarily the ideology of capitalism, which is a gigantic thing, like Jack is saying, but, like, the little nodal points of, uh, if you work, you'll get ahead. Another way of getting at it, too, is... Um... But, but, but to say that, oh, like, right. to, but but to say like the if you work you'll get ahead is to say that nature will serve you if you work. So you know there's like a, there's nature offering to you because this this is how it works. You know they don't go further, but like they just state stuff like this. But there's a whole machine, you know, behind it. Yeah, there there appears an absence of discourse, but it has a way of reconstituating the discourse, right? To get at this from another angle, with the axiomatic also comes territorializing, right? So I think with ideology, this is kind of another way of getting at your question. With ideology, there's I think there's more directly going to be a connotation of codes and territorialities. But with the axiomatic, you have decoding and uh, recoding. You have deterritorializing okay. and so, re-territorializing. So would it be insane then for me to say uh, the axiomatics actually, uh, it's not the same thing as ideology. I, I actually like the way of thinking of this. Uh, axiomatics are things that almost exist pre-ideology and that ideology is actually in a way the virtual elements that come from the interaction of these axiomatics with reality. So it's almost the virtual layer is the ideology and the way that it surfaces in the subjective realm. But the axiomatics come far be before that. Axiomatics I, don't I, need ideology. Yeah. Go ahead, because Roger. Ideology is, you know, there's no ideology in nature. There's no ideology in animals. It's it's a purely anthropocentric understanding. Subjectivity. Then, but yeah, but like there's intentionality too. To ideology, there must be an intention. There's a political intention to it, but the axiom doesn't require that. Yeah, I would almost like to say that I think you're close, Brooks, but I would almost say virtual, the thing that's virtual in what I'm seeing is the axiomatics. Ideology it can touch on some of those virtual elements, but it's much more in the realm of representation, I think. But what I like about what how Jack was explaining it is like, because because from if, if, it, if it is linked to commands, this is also kind of the their general... Uh, modus operandi isn't it that they're productive commands problem with ideology is that it often this is like althusser's whole project it, it, you have to create this whole framework of belief and lack of belief if there's a system of knowledge or you know precepts that are say certain things and people have to believe them you have to find ways to convince people to believe them then you get into all these very complex theories of interpolation and 
you know, it's like modern conspiracy theorists almost of like, yeah, there's the, the brainwave, the TV is trying to convert you through its brainwaves and stuff. But axiomatic seems almost a much more elegant and simple way of dealing with that of like, the commands are productive in that you don't even have to believe them for them to have an effect, which is where I, I like that penny example, like you said, Jack, but it's almost like, you no know, one needs to tell you even to save a penny a day or any anything like that. The axiomatics of like the way your job is structured and your bank account and your pension and all these things, they are sending those commands in a sense in all in a million verbal and nonverbal ways. So that kind of mm -hmm. obviates the need for some kind of ideology that is, you know, it's not the Chicago School of Economics I was saying. That's not capitalism. That's produced post facto. Capitalism starts in England in like the early 1800s that, by some arguments. So, you know, that's pre-ideology. Yeah. yeah. So Two. if I can read something of one of the links that I posted earlier, really short, but uh, it gives a, a good analysis. The capitalist axiomatics ability to establish relations and connections between the coded flows that are otherwise incommensurable and unrelated and to subordinate these flows to a general isomorphy, EI, uh, i.e. all subject must be produced for the market leads dollars and guattari to posit a resurgence beyond citizenship sovereignty and legitimation of a machinic enslavement which no longer referred to an emperor or a transcendent figure is made all the more cruel by its impersonality inasmuch as its mode of operation can entirely bypass objective belief or the coding of human behavior such an axiomatic moves us from a society of discipline to a society of control where power acts directly on a decoded individual matter not only do flows continues to evade and even overpower the axiomatic but the global and non-qualified subjectivity in capital never attains absolute deterioration and is always accompanied by forms of social subjection in the guise of nation state and a panoply of territorialization at the level of its mode of realization. So, you know, it, 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 it gets us out of, you know, uh, sites of power. It's, it's, it's over sites of power. Yeah. To make one final uh, expansion of the argument with, with, I, so like with ideologies, there's a way of saying, okay, well, Okay, you think that that's we're going to take that back to an ideology that sits behind it, right? And so, like in that way, it would almost seem to be like I'm going to argue it's pre-conscious or sort of like uh, trans individual in that sense, right? We're kind of looking at the transcendent almost, which I think is where they're kind of starting to critique um, at least Marxist notions of ideology here, because in that way, right? Like this is going to get into a very like narrow argument where it's about taking down an ideology, yeah. Um, and an ideology that might not even be there. But because we're talking about the unconscious, because we're getting into the, the axiomatic here in this sense of, of coding and territorialization and the way that that plays into desiring social machines, right? It's possible for these, like with the Ben Franklin example, that can speak to what we would call ideologies at once. It doesn't matter if you're a Nazi or if you're... Um, a kindergartner, that's going to speak to you, isn't it? Right. That, and this gets at what Roger is talking about. In that way, power actually has a more pronounced anonymity. Um, it's even harder in some sense to place a face on it, to locate it, because it has a way of, of affecting so much. And in that sense, like ideology is much more narrow, I think, in terms of conception, even with um, Alcazarian inter interpolation. Right. If we're talking about in terms of the axiomatic and the capitalist machine, that's different than talking about it in terms of an ideology that you're just kind of stuck in. Uh -huh. So it in you know, if we make a if we want to make a difference right now with the in social sciences or um you know, in social groups, people are fighting ideologies. They're fighting representation, representation of minorities, of different bodies, whatever, you know, like you can call it like racism, ableism, whatever. But it fights on the level of ideology to replace a representation by another. But at the same time, you're never going to change shit if you don't change the axiom on you know, on which they are based. The axiom is what's behind. The axiom is the diagram. You need to attack the diagram by a criticism of the ontological. 
not the criticism of the epistemological, uh, epistemological. You need to go further than that. It's just, and, and that's why identity politics, and this is my own thing, <laughs> but that's why identity politics right now are really problematic because they're not changing anything. They're just re-inscribing the subject into a different manner. Is so this, basically- Is this from the discussion we were having in another channel? We were just talking about intersectionality and the nature of the left versus the left on Twitter and how people are fighting over the different ratios of whether we need to structurally change class or whether it's more about race. We literally were having this discussion overnight last night. Oh, was yeah? it with you, okay. Eliosha? No, I was not. But, but that's precisely it. You use the term ratio, right? Ratiocination. This is exactly what they're critiquing with psychoanalysis and Ricardo, which I think is them pointing at Marx sort of at the sideways glance, is that, okay, you found the abstract essence, great. But now it's worse than ever because now it's now we can kind of see it and it's still got a tight grasp on us. You know, this isn't, you know, you, you stop so quickly. I think that example that was in that quote, actually, of the dividual, that, that crystallized it for me. Uh, it's something I've brought up a, a few times, but I don't know where it was. I think it was in a Lazzarato I was reading, maybe the Making of the Indented Man. But he talks about Deleuze and the, and the dividual, and it's such a... He, he talks about like you know the act of going up to an ATM and accessing the money that you have. It's like you're making an error if you look at that as if, as though you are an individual going to do this thing and you're receiving this service. Like you, there's a part of you that is experiencing that way, but as a individual, you're sort of already divided. And there's a part of you which is essentially just another node in a financial network, and that you need that node needs to exist for that financial network to continue operating. So all you are, from the perspective of that financial network, your existence as an individual is kind of immaterial and it's acting upon you. It's not, it's not even just in a subconscious way, which was, again, that's how you might look at it through the lens of ideology of like, oh, well, ATMs are convincing you that money is real. It actually is, it's instantiating you as the kind of subject as you are in the act of accessing the, your financial institution. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really because Because it's the money plugging into you. It's the 8 a.m. plugging into you and not the reverse, you know? And that's the thing. That's that's what they're saying. The, the machine is producing you. The machine is always producing the subject. It's not from the subject perspective that machines are being enacted. You are being enacted by the machine. It's, it's, it's always this reversal that is going on. Yeah, and with that, to, to, to look back at with like the, the ATM and that, right? That's just one means of quantification. If we start dealing with things like okay, how are we going to, um, you know, tackle problems like gender or, or race? And it becomes a means of um, quantifying bodies, right? We're, we're talking about representation again, or at least we have that risk. Or with ableism and that, right? You know, this, this weighing of the scales in that sense, it, it gets at what Roger's talking about, where we haven't actually gone at the axiom, but more so now we're even, uh, the axiom seems to have a tighter grip on the, the very thing we thought we were fighting against and this is the reactionary investment mm -hmm. and you know like just just you know i'm, I'm not going to go far into this but like in my own thesis it, it either of like asking the question like how why why how is the city ableist you know i don't ask this question i'm asking how the city is producing bodies and how it becomes ableist you know towards the end but you need to go further than this negative differentiation and then to like, what is the differentiation produced by the city? And like, by which axiom does it differentiate? And people never go there. I've never seen any text go there. And maybe Jan Buchanan actually went that far, but in social sciences, people don't want to touch that because, you know, it's a, it's a whole industry of, you know, representation. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention about axioms, <clears throat> like the classic is the axioms of geometry. And in axioms, there are all these undefinables. So like in, in geometry, it's the, it's the point and the, the line or the sign and the trace. Um, you know, those things are not defined in the axioms themselves. So the things that are flowing through the axioms, which are these undefinables, themselves are not defined uh, by the axioms, but the axioms open up this field in which you can 
uh, produce theorems that are stable. Um, and so you get these different uh, kind of articulations of the undefinables in those in that field, but the undefinables stay undefinable, undefined. <clears throat> So if you change the axioms, then you can change the 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 undefined the undefined elements. I really like that, Kent. What, what you just shared, I would just disagree with the last point. Um, it sounds like the undefinables are immutable, um, but that somehow they can be repositioned. Uh, at which point? the axioms are at work in order to reposition them. And then uh, there's a superstructure that's built on top of the axioms that you pointed out as a theorem. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I also have a question of, are we dealing, you know, we, we have a sort of the slips of the tongue in terms of starting to think of these axioms analogically, almost metaphorically, you got me thinking, can we ever really pinpoint uh, these axioms, and as you pointed out, one layer underneath that, the immutable, um, I forgot the term that you use, undefinables. To briefly interject, when we're, so when we're talking about this, right, like this conversation and everything we're talking about with the axioms and that doesn't happen outside of the reality of power, right? So like if we want to use Ken's um, example of, um, or rather his analysis regarding like undefinables and definables. So that doesn't just sit out in the world that we're, and it's just there and it happens to discover us. These are things that power has a certain hallmark with. Power and a major part of power at that is the ability to define and uh, and leave things undefined, to redefine. Uh, uh, you know, because uh, Deleuze and Guattari are talking about um surplus value of flows or differentials flows flows in relationship to flows you know another analogy is the spreadsheets by which derivatives are defined so derivatives you know there's this undefined thing money there's an undefined thing commodity right but then but then those spreadsheets that are the derivatives create complex uh relations between those flows that that then become the basis of, of betting on the you know on outcomes uh, in the economy, and uh, and and right now there's there's more money in derivatives than anything else. For those listening at home, I think he's referring to financial derivatives. Yeah. So I'm just saying there's there's certain analogies you know that you can make. To try to understand what these axiomatics are, uh, and and we need to search for those those uh, embodiments of these axiomatics. You know, it's one thing just to say there's axiomatics, but it's another thing to come up with examples where you can see them actually at work, and that's what we need more of. Mm -hmm. Roger, could you give you you meant you so in chat you wrote we speak, and I think you're you're absolutely onto it. Could you speak a little bit more on the the, the ironic phrase we speak? I did not say that. I was answering. <laughs> Hello, Shige was asking if we were talking in chat. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Well, the reason I I thought that was relevant, I call it ironic. I think that's exactly it, though. Is we in, the axioms we encounter are, are every day, right? We, you know, I'm sure you've heard that Ben Franklin thing at one point or another. But um, you know, at least when I was working in um in, in one of my previous jobs, I constantly heard this: don't reinvent the wheel. You know, there's, yeah. you're going to encounter them. They're not, uh, they're not far away from you. And that's actually the scary thing is they're, they're not far away from you at all. Right. But, but, but also, oh, so there's this kind of difference between these aphoristic statements like that, that are uncollected and an axiomatic because there, there, there's an axiomatic platform, right? Which is the bringing of these axioms together to produce this convex uh, space in which you're going to prove theorems, and so the the there's kind of like a nexia a nexum <laughs> nexus in which these these uh, these various uh, aphorisms 
with their undefinables are brought together into close proximity to produce a space. That that's that seems to work for me. The, the idea of producing a field because that that is also pretty much consistent with everything else that D and G seem to be uh, concerned with. So it's it's th th those aphorisms are almost a reflection of the field that is produced. So in some way they operate on an unconscious level, but the axioms aren't necessarily those aphorisms themselves, but the processes that produce them. Well, it would be to go back very specifically to where they talk about the construction of the field. They talk about that in the second paragraph. In this field, the father has a role only as agent of production, anti-production, goes on to talk about that the father is creating that field and the mother by uh, the child asking to borrow a gear here, a lever there, uh, pieces of the machines that are building it. So it, it actually really works. That really works nicely. I want to respond to um, uh, what you said in chat too. There is a temptation to think of like those as cliches, but we got to keep in mind McLuhan here, right? Um, it can be cliche or it can be archetypal. Right, like this was something that Wallace was really interested in is this way that seemingly trite phrases can all of a sudden become really powerful, right? Where old wives tales can be dismissed, but all of a sudden become, um, without changing the really any of the words, quite in, impinging. Right, I, I tend to like to use the term cliche uh, or at least think it's in reference to that because if there is an artistic thing that Deleuze is trying to get at through all of his artistic critiques, it is the destruction of the cliché, and he talks about them very, 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 very slowly. Yeah, actually, we've hit the two-hour mark, mark uh, pretty helpfully. Uh, let's, uh, we're, we're going to put a pin in this discussion completely, and we will continue again tomorrow. Uh, same bat time, same bat place, noon, uh, and we will continue.